in the first session, we discussed, you know, the policies and the, the bigger picture approaches to addressing air pollution and climate mitigation. Uh, session two is on the role of research and technology for promoting clean air and climate mitigation. And I hope our moderator and speakers for session two are ready. Uh, sorry, we just had to quickly change the plan because we are running a little bit behind time. So uh, to moderate session two, we have Dr. Archana Walia. Uh, she is the director of the Clean Air, Clean Air Asia office in India. She leads the implementation of the India program and related projects for Clean Air Asia in India. Uh, Archana has over 25 years of extensive work experience, of which 15 years has been in progressive leadership roles of country director, deputy office director, senior advisor, and team leader. Her experience spreads over sectors ranging from climate change, clean energy, energy efficiency, and urban development. Uh, so Archana, I hand over the floor to you, please. Thank you, Karma, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's an honor for me to be uh, moderating this session. And uh, before we get into the session, uh, again, those of you who are joining now, we just a few reminders uh, about the event that uh, the whole event is being recorded, uh, video as well as the chat. And all the participants are requested to send their questions and comments via the QA box. We will try to respond to as many, and some of them can be responded uh, uh, by the panelists um, during the session itself. And the presentation slides will be made available at the DevAsia page. Um, so with that, I have the honor and the pleasure to introduce our panelists to you. Um, let me first... Um, introduce Professor Puji Lestari. Professor Puji is, um, is a professor of air quality management at atmospheric chemistry, faculty of civil and environmental engineering at Bandung Institute of Technology. She's the chair of research group on air and waste management of ITB. She conducts work in the field of air pollution, air quality monitoring and modeling, aerosol characteristics and composition, and GHG emissions inventory. Welcome, Professor Puji. Our next panelist is Professor Hukubin, an academician of Chinese Academy of Engineering, School of Environment, Tsinghua University. Uh, he's the Dean of Tsinghua University, Institute of Carbon Neutrality, and the Vice Chairman of the National Expert Committee for Ecology and Environmental Protection. His research focus has been on PM 2.5 pollution, characterization of complicated emission sources and multi-pollutant control, and the coordinated control of air pollution and greenhouse gases. Welcome, Professor Hukubin. Last but not the least, our last panelist is Mr. Ege Saxena, who's a senior fellow and senior director at the Electricity and Fuels Division in the Energy Research Institute in India. He has over 37 years of experience in the power sector in India and working on energy transitions in the Indian power sector to develop a roadmap for low carbon pathways. He leads the work on power sector policy, reforms, regulations, demand side management, action plans, and smart grids. Again, a very warm welcome, Professor Mr. Senna. So with that, we will start uh, the panel discussion. And my first question is to Professor Lestari. Uh, Professor, you are leading the research on tackling emissions of air pollutants and DHGs from various sectors. Could you please tell us more about your research work on measuring vehicle emissions during using remote sensing? And also based on your findings so far, what role do you think remote sensing can play in data collection on air quality and DHGs? Over to you, Professor. Thank you, Dr. Walia. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you for your introduction and also for your questions. Well, I will answer uh, your uh, question by sharing some of slides here that, uh, can you, uh, next please, the slide. Yes. 
there are actually several issues that need to be addressed, as I think all we know that one of the key sectors contributing to air pollution in urban area mostly is from transportation. But we also know that there is a gap in data collection, especially from the uh, uh, lab measurement or on-route measurement. There are very, very limited number of vehicle emission data available so far. And we also know that there is still lack of inadequate and reliable data to support the decision making. By using the remote sensing technology, I think the remote sensing can address this issue uh, of the uh, lack of the data collections. Let me show you how we actually, the, the remote sensing is working. The remote sensing was uh, placed on the side of the road and the car is moving. And then the, the, the remote sensing could directly measure the exhaust plume here with the emission and also equipped with the camera which can capture the license plate number. So I will show you the video. Can you please uh, just click the video? Yes. See, this is the, 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 the remote sensing, how remote sensing measuring without disrupting or without disruption of the uh, car flowing or car moving so that uh, remote sensing could actual uh, uh, measure actual emission on the road. So that's basically from uh, the remote sensing. And uh, remote sensing actually could collect uh, the data in 0 0.5 second, 0 0.5 second. It is, so it's very fast and also very reliable uh, data collection because only 0 0.5 second they could collect the data and uh, the emission can be measured by remote sensing technology. We could measure the concentration of the uh, pollutants in a vehicle exhaust plume and also measure the speed and also acceleration and also uh, road condition also can be measured here. And then also vehicle license plate number can be captured uh, using the remote sensing uh, technology because they were equipped with the camera. And then with the uh, license plate number is also very, very important because license plate number can be used to uh, obtain the information, so technical information related to the type of the car and then the model of the car, fuel type, emission standard, uh, years of production, and also the production of the, uh, the car. Could you please hit another? Yes, so this one is just showing the, the information actually on how remote sensing uh, read the data. So this one is from the reading of the remote sensing reading. They can directly uh, uh, read or uh, measure the uh, vehicle speed, acceleration, and all the concentration. And this one is capturing the license plate number, which is very important to support the data analysis as you will uh, get all the technical information from the uh, uh, license plate number. Our project last year, uh, we share this using remote sensing in Jakarta, was supported by ICCT, collected about 187,000 vehicle emission data from 20 tolls and non-toll routes in Jakarta with very high capture rate, about 70 to 85 percent. So uh, this our finding also uh, identify individual low and high emitters. As you see here, the emission uh, concentration from different type of car was showing here from passenger, taxi, bus, uh, and then light duty, heavy duty also can be seen or can be identified from uh, remote sensing. And then remote sensing also can be used to generate a real world emission factors. We call it real world emission. It is because a measure directly on the road without disrupting. So this one is actual emission on the road. And also actually identify current fleet. Please hit one. Yeah, so this one is uh, actually the population, uh, car population in Jakarta. So we found that the passenger cars contribute about 80% of the total cars in, in Jakarta. Next slide, please. 
Yes, no, I, I, I want to answer your second question about the role of the remote sensing data in collection or improving the data collection and also supporting the decision making. So remote sensing data could determine the real world emission, as I just mentioned before. And in this case, we also uh, uh, generating the emission factors from the uh, remote sensing data and uh, from different type of car, different type of uh, fuel can be uh, uh, measured the emission or calculated the emission. So for example, in this graph, we can see that the passenger car with gasoline uh, vehicle generating the emission of NOx here. And then with the different fuel type like uh, diesel engine then have a higher emission here. And so this one is the emission factor generating from the uh, remote sensing data because we could collect a huge amount of uh, data collected. And then from the emission factor, we could use to improve the uh, air pollutant emission inventory as well as the greenhouse gas emission inventory. And then uh, improving the air pollution inventory, we could have better understanding of what kind of source of pollution, uh, air pollution in the area or in the city or in the country. And then we also, especially from transport sector, then you could also identify what type of transport that contribute more or the heavy duty passenger car then can be a uh, highlight there. And then also from knowing or better understanding the source of air pollution, then uh, we can create or suggest uh, new policies to address those issues. And also the remote sensing can also be used to track the technology effectiveness. Uh, next slide, please. Next seat, maybe, yes. And actually this, uh, this graph is showing that older vehicle has higher emission compared to the newest uh, vehicle. So we can see here that's uh, decreasing the emission by introducing new technology. So this one also actually, if we working with the producent car or car producer, then we could identify what type of technology and what she introducing here, but then, Again, we can see the, the trend of uh, uh, reducing the emission from the year to the years as the newest car will have the lowest one. And then also the last uh, uh, one, I can also show you that the, the remote sensing data can be used also to track the policy effectiveness. If we can see this uh, down up here, the yellow one, so we group them in three different uh, years of production, less than 2007. And then uh, between 2007 and 2015 and above 2015. And then we can also see the significant uh, reduction of the emission for the old car to the new car or the new policy. Because in 2007, uh, actually the government in Indonesia implementing the uh, Euro 2 standard in effectively in 2007. So we can see that the, the reduction here. So this is the policy effectiveness. And then the 2015, above 2015, actually Euro 3 was implemented, but it's only for motorcycle. But we can still see the sum of the reduction here on this uh, emission reduction. We actually can still track another policy if for example, the Euro 4 implemented in 2020, then we could still break this down into more uh, policy uh, uh, policy action so that we can see how effective is the policy implemented in the country. So that's basically, I can, uh, is there this one answering your question, Dr. Walia? So this one, uh, I can summarize that basically remote sensing, it's very important. Uh, for the data collections, very important in generating the emission, real world emission factors, improving the emission inventory, and also tracking technology effectiveness, tracking policy effectiveness, and also actually, again, steering new policy to address those all issues to improve air quality and promote clean air. Next slides. Thank you very much. So this is just basically summarize what just I said about the remote sensing that can be used to provide significant information to policymakers to reduce air pollution and 
greenhouse gas emission, especially from the transport sector. Thank you very much. Um, Archana, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Puji. I think that was such a concise and comprehensive uh, presentation. And I think a perfect example of how technology can serve the basic need of having the data, both for policy formulation, for uh, you know handling the voluminous data that is required, and also for tracking the uh, progress and the impact of the policy. Thank you very much. That was That was great. Uh, we now move on to Professor Hickabin uh, and hear from him as to what they are doing in China. Professor, my question to you would be, what role did air quality data play in implementing air pollution prevention and control action plan in People Republic of China? What challenges did you face in building the data collection capacity in PRC and how was it overcome? Over to you, Professor. Thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Wani. Uh, may I have a slide here? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, thank you. So uh, I think that uh, here I just uh, first was, I just shown the uh, the recent years. Actually, since uh, 2013, China has a, a very significant uh, changes for the air quality. Uh, so the uh, just take the uh, PM 2.5 as the example. And we can see uh, here uh, the year 2013, that is the most, uh, the, the serious pollution is happening. It's a re really regional problem, especially in the area uh, Beijing and surrounding area, surrounding provinces. And also some of the areas, especially in the Yangtze River Delta and uh, some uh, points for the, uh, 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 the uh, Polar River Delta. But you can see things that from 2013 and 17 and also 2020. So it really has a very large, uh, uh, the, the uh, harvest changes. So uh, for so, so the national wide, the, uh, if we take in the data of the uh, three, we have uh, more than 300 cities, the average PM 2.5, 2013 is uh, more than 16, and 2017 is uh, 14, five, less than 45. Uh, the year 2020 is uh, uh, 33, uh, and last year is uh, even uh, is uh, 30. So it's continuous uh, uh, changes. Uh, actually, we 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 were getting this data like, like the. Uh, the, the, the Chinese map, uh, we have uh, uh, same, uh, integrated the ground uh, uh, monetary system and also the uh, satellite system uh, together. So that is, uh, we call it a tricking air pollution in China, uh, the data source. So it's uh, not only the ground, uh, but also the, uh, the remote data from satellites. Uh, so here you can see the uh, recent publication from the University of Chicago. It's uh, one of the uh, research group uh, from University of Chicago. Uh, they have uh, shown uh, actually the uh, uh, compared to uh, the U.S. and China uh, uh, for uh, the almost the fourteen percent reduction of the PM two point five. Uh, 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 the historic story showing uh, the uh, uh, records showing the U.S. has taken uh, like the, uh, uh, almost thirteen uh, years, but uh, only seven, almost seven years. We have the China has realized that goal. So I think so that is really uh, the, the Bloomberg just showing this information. So so that is really the uh, the difficult job. But how can we? Uh, Doing that, I think the science and technology is a very important supporting for uh, to this uh, re results. Uh, the uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, you can see here. Uh, uh, I think the previous uh, uh, presentation from Professor Jiang Shuqiu has mentioned. You know, the, in recent ten years, China has uh, the two. Uh, uh, most important uh, na national action plan. The first we call is uh, 
air pollution uh, uh, prevention control action plan that is uh, from 2013 to 2017. So they have identified the national goal. So the uh, uh, of the policy uh, uh, is from the total emission control to the air uh, concentration control. So they directly required the different region like say, uh, the BAT is something like the Jinjinji is a Beijing and surrounding area. So they required this area should improve the PM 2.5 concentration by 20%, uh, 25% within uh, five years. Uh, for uh, Yangtze River Delta is 20% and the uh, Polo River Delta is 15%. And national wise is a uh, 10% for uh, the PM, uh, PM10. So that, that, that is uh, uh, by using this, uh, uh, the scientific data, they identify the most important area and those, uh, and then they have some uh, different, uh, the, the different policy or the target requirements. So we, we, we can see something like a calm but differential uh, policy target in different Chinese uh, region. And so the second uh, action plan uh, uh, is uh, 2018 to 2020. So they, they still re, re, uh, required within five years, they have a, a national wide, this is a 15% uh, uh, improvements. So actually uh, the, all, of the, uh, all of those uh, policy uh, targets or the action plan and also the technology, uh, uh, the, the uh, 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 options, so is getting the strong supporting from the scientific and also technology uh, research results. So I myself involved uh, all of the procedures for this two action plan, uh, uh, not only the formulating, but also the enforcement and even the uh, po uh, uh, post-evaluation. So uh, uh, I think that, that, that is, uh, we, we just showing uh, for, for uh, since 2013 uh, until last year, uh, uh, almost uh, they said uh, within the recent nine years, China's uh, SO2 emission uh, is from 21 million to 3 million. So that is a huge reduction, uh, especially in the uh, power, uh, coal power sector. Uh, it's 85% reduction for NOx. Uh, including power industry and uh, transportation, transportation sector. So the national total emission of NOx is from 23 million to 9 million already. Uh, it's, it's, uh, com uh, compared to SO2, it's relatively difficult for, for NOx. Right? It's also from 23 million to 9 million is uh, uh, almost uh, uh, like the more than 15% reduction. For primary PM2, uh, for primary particulate matters, is a 30% reduction. Uh, even for VOC, uh, the, the uh, uh, emissions is uh, still uh, almost this 30, uh, uh, three days of, uh, percent. So 30%. So, so when, when we find there is a blue sky in the air, the real work is uh, on the ground. So they have a huge work for the emission reduction. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, today we talk about the core benefits, uh, uh, air pollution and the, uh, uh, the, the carbon reduction. So actually we have uh, also have the good news for that. So blue sky action actually also has a, uh, uh, promotes the results of the carbon reduction. Uh, from 2013 to 2020, China's CO2 emission uh, increase, annual increase rates is only 1% compared to 2020 to 2013. So the, the, that 10, almost 10 years, the annual uh, growth rates is almost 9%, more than 9%. So since the Blue Sky Action Plan, the annual uh, average uh, uh, emission uh, growth rates from 9% reduced to 1%. So uh, 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 for example, for the industrial sector, we have doing a lot of working of uh, 
in uh, emanation of a small coal uh, boiler, shut down the outdated production facilities, clean heating in a uh, 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 rural area or something like that. So it really works not only for pollution, but also uh, for the carbon reduction. So next slide, please. So here, I think answer your question, uh, Dr. Wale. Uh, most, I just mentioned scientific and technology re uh, results. Actually to the policymaker is uh, uh, the data uh, uh, intensive working. So you have to show, here I just shown the, uh, I've had, uh, actually there is a most important uh, three group of the data uh, air concentration data, meteorological data, those two is in the air. But the most important is the emission inventory data is in the ground. So these three group of the data, I will show you the, uh, on the uh, uh, NIFTA side in China, the air quantity monitoring system uh, for, from 2015 uh, to 2012, we have only 17 uh, four cities involved. And 168 to 2008, and today is 399. Uh, so the total uh, national monetary data is uh, almost uh, more than uh, 1,500. So the, uh, the density is almost uh, the same density as the uh, United States uh, uh, today. And also the monetary air pollutants from the three uh, pollutants like PM10, SO2, and uh, uh, NO2. Uh, today it's come to uh, uh, a sixth rating, uh, include, especially for the uh, PM2.5 and also uh, uh, ozone, the, uh, in, uh, very important. Uh, that is just the national uh, monetary data for the uh, management system. And uh, for the scientific system, there is a lot of what uh, we call the super sites, uh, uh, including the chemical, um, uh, composition uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, for like uh, sulfate nitrates and or uh, uh, the the uh, uh, organic uh, carbon uh, organic uh, part of them. So I think say uh, also the important things is uh, uh, for the emission uh, on the uh, uh, right side. So you can see we have it's just shown more than ten a uh, hundred thousand uh, points large point source in China, but you have getting the details for for example here we have uh, uh, coal file uh, uh, SO two and coal have file NOx and also iron and steel SO two uh, cement NOx and uh, 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 industrial boilers. So not only the total emission, but also is they have detailed points, uh, the location information. So it's something like the GIS. So if you're getting each of them, any of them, you can get the details or what kind of uh, pollutants and also uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, production, uh, even the power, uh, the, the electricity uh, consumption data. So you can, you can use in that to do in not only the uh, policy making process, but also the uh, supervision during the enforcement. Uh, so they, uh, they have doing this. Uh, uh, so they have, we have to, our work is uh, to get in the uh, interaction between the, not the ground emission to the air concentration by using the different uh, air quantity model for different region and different city and different seasons. So, and then you have, you can generate the calm but differential control of uh, the, the policy. And finally, uh, the, uh, the government uh, can, can approve the national action plan and also uh, it will be very effective uh, uh, for the for enforcement. So I just uh, stop here and uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Huckabin. I think that was a great example from your country to share how data and um, uh, you know remote sensing and everything, a scientific-based approach can help provide the right kind of evidence to the policymakers for 
meeting the objectives of the uh, you know your national action plans both for reduction of pm 2.5 as well as arresting the growth of the co2 emissions so thank you so much for your comments mm, so we have a, a, i would request participants to keep posting their questions on the q and a uh, and we would like to move down to mr ak saxena our last uh, panelist um Mr. Saxena, during the annual climate change conference or COP26 last year, many countries made pledges to peak GHG emissions and reach net zero GHG emissions. Shifting to clean energy will be critical for meeting these pledges. So what are the current opportunities in your view for introducing and scaling up clean technology in the energy sector in Asia? Professor Saxena. Thank, Thank you so much, Dr. Rachna. Thanks a lot. First of all, a very good morning to all of you. And thanks to the Asian Development Bank for inviting me uh, for to this S20 high-level policy webinar. It's an absolute pleasure and privilege for me. Thank you so much. Now, I would like to take you through, to, through the India's commitment to the climate action, which have been there from starting from 2015. And then I'll take you through some of the key sectors which are there the power sector, the industrial sector, the transport sector, the cooking, and the agriculture sector, wherein what all we have done, what all we can do about, that is what is, I hope, plan to present in the next 10 minutes or so. I think India undertook an initiative for introducing clean technology and the clean sources of energy, in the right earners, even prior to the COP21, when the target for solar energy was increased from 20 gigawatt to 100 gigawatt. And overall, RE energy capacity target was enhanced to 175 gigawatt by the year 2022. And post the Paris, uh, Paris summit, India outlined its commitment in the form of uh, the nationally determined contributions. And the three main contributions were in the form of achieving the 40% of the installed generation capacity from the non-fossil fuel sources by 2030 reducing the carbon intensity, emissions intensity of economy by 30 to 35% by uh, as compared to the 2005 levels. And thirdly, expanding the carbon sink by 2.5 to 3 gigaton of CO2 through the additional forest cover. And I'm very happy to inform, and many of you might be knowing that India is the only country among the G20 countries to be on track to achieve the Paris commitments. I would like to give you certain examples of the achievement of the targets of NDPs, NDCs. Now, firstly, in regard to the installed generation capacity from non-fossil fossil fuels, I think the target for 2030 is 40%, and we have already achieved about 40%, about nine years ahead of the target year of 2030. Currently, in the year 2022, we stand the non-fossil fuel-based installed generation capacity stands at about 41% uh, of the total installed capacity mix in the country. When we come to the electricity generation part, I think uh, now the, the emissions intensity part, I would say, I think the plan was to reduce, the target was to reduce to 30 to 35%. And as of now, we have achieved a reduction of the order of 28% as compared to the pre-industrial levels. So I think we are well on track to achieve some one we have already achieved and the others we are on track to achieve. That's what is point number one. Now, the roadmap for achieving net zero carbon uh, for India was set by our Honorable Prime Minister at Glasgow, uh, wherein he announced that India will reach the net zero target by 2070, but the targets for 2030 are very well defined and they define the roadmap for India to achieve the clean uh, energy transition. I think the first target is in regard to the enhancement of the installed generation capacity or the renewable capacity. I think the from 175 gigawatt to be achieved in 2022, the, it has been scaled up to 500 gigawatt of non-fossil fuel-based capacity by 2030. Uh, secondly, I think uh, the 50% the, uh, of energy in 2030 should come from the renewable energy sources. Thirdly, I think India has to reduce the projected carbon emissions by 1 billion ton. And fourthly, the carbon intensity of economies to be reduced by 
So it's a significant upscaling of the uh, targets as compared to what was announced at Paris. And the ambit of the targets has also been enhanced and the roadmap up to 20070 is to be defined and various actions are being taken by various entities. Today we stand at about non-fossil fuel based capacities approximately 163 gigawatt. And when we have to move to 500 gigawatt, this is an ambitious target. The scale is certainly ambitious and challenging, but various actions are being taken and the pathways are being discussed and formed up. If we talk about the electricity generation, 50% uh, has to come by 2030 from the renewable energy sources. I think when we, the, in the 2015, the 20% came from the, uh, the non-fossil sources. Now, in a, today in 2022, it has increased from 20% to 25%. And the studies have been done up to 2030 by various agencies, including Terry. And our studies for 2030 show that non-fossil energy contribution could be of the order of 55 to 56% by 2030. So I think we are on track to achieve the 50% contribution, at least from the power sector in the energy mix. Uh, this time. So these are the sort of uh, the targets which have been defined in terms of the NDCs uh, and what is the uh, achievement so far and what can be done. Uh, what can be done is to be uh, firmed up in the coming days. Now, insofar as uh, technologies are concerned in the renewable energy, we have gone largely on solar and wind. But, uh, uh, in the solar, the ground-mounted solar and the rooftop solar are there. The ground-mounted solar has picked up but the opportunities are there in the solar rooftop, which need to be scaled up uh, quite significantly. Now, on the wind side, I think onshore wind progress has been pretty satisfactory, but offshore wind is a sector wherein, and the floating solar is another area where I think the India would like to take the further steps and define the roadmap. How do we reach there? Another area in the power sector, which has been significantly sort of a, can be remarked about is the new environmental norms for the uh, thermal power stations were uh, formulated in the year 2015, 2015 and the norms for CO2 were made, made more stringent and the new norms were introduced for SOX, NOx and mercury as well as water con cons consumption. I think uh, the uh, various power stations are doing their best to uh, comply with these norms. Now, if I try to come on to the another aspect of the clean energy transition, apart from the moving from the fossil fuel based capacity to non fossil fuel based capacity or the renewable energy, one the the another pillar one can talk about is energy efficiency or the energy conservation. And in the industrial sector, I would talk about there are I think uh, there is a scheme called Perform, Achieve, and Trade scheme, which is there designed to achieve the required energy efficiency in the energy intensive sectors. The energy consumption norms have been set up for these and they are set up by the our agency called Bureau of Energy Efficiency. And the these uh, designated uh, industries, uh, industries are called as designated consumers. And this is a market-based compliance mechanism, which is aimed to accelerate the improvement in energy efficiency in these sectors. And the energy savings which are achieved by the notified industries, they are converted into energy savings certificates and they are called ESERTs and they are, after they are issued, they are traded at the power exchanges. I'll just give you an example. This uh, the Perform, Achieve and Trade, which we have abbreviated as PAD. The first cycle was started in the year 2012 and it was a three-year cycle. The target for achievement was the, the reduction is the secondary energy, specific energy consumption was of the order of the board. 6.6 .6 million ton of oil equipment. And the actual achievement was 30% more than the target. And the achievement was about 8.67 million ton of oil equipment, uh, million ton of oil equivalent. Uh, so far, a number of cycles have been done. And uh, totally, the six bad uh, cycles have been dealt in March of 2020, which I have the data readily. And a total of 1,073 designated consumers covering 13 sectors we have rolled out these schemes. And it is projected that the total savings from these is of the order of 26 million ton of oil equivalent. They translate into avoiding about 70 million ton of CO2 by March 2023. 
So that is what is about the industry sector. We move on to the um, transport sector, which is another major contributor. About 18% of total energy consumption in India comes from the transport sector, and it translates into approximately 94 million ton of oil equivalent by the transport sector. Now, I think the electric mobility is being given a great push and thrust in India, and the innovative pricing solutions, appropriate technology, and the infrastructure is being aimed at. The most important uh, uh, the considerations in the electric mobility are the cost, the range anxiety, and the uh, EV charging infrastructure. And the government of India is taking uh, initiatives for all of these. And the Ministry of Power, the Union Ministry of Power, has issued charging infrastructure guidelines for the electric vehicles. There is a national policy also, which has been announced for a number of promotional measures over the last 10 years. It will be difficult for me to cover all of them in the short time available, but faster adoption and manufacturing of hybrid and electric vehicles, the phase one and phase two has been there, which gives a push to the electric mobility in the country. Along with the, the, the along with this like, integral part is the phase manufacturing program to give a boost to the electric mobility, domestic manufacturing in the country. And there is a national mission on transportive mobility and storage also. And the roles and responsibilities of various organizations are clearly defined in that regard. Uh, another area of interest in India is about the hydrogen and the Honorable Prime Minister of India, Shri Narendra Modi, announced the National Hydrogen Mission in August 2021. The mission aims to aid, um, aid in meeting the climate targets and make India a green hydrogen hub. And their target is to produce by 5 million ton of green hydrogen per annum by the year 2030. So uh, this is a promising area. I think uh, right now the cost effectiveness is uh, in question, but I think as the scales as which are there in India, uh, they will certainly bring the cost to the reasonable levels. Cooking is another area wherein we have shifted from the, the traditional uh, biomass cooking, etc., firewood cooking, etc., to the clean uh, uh, cooking sources like uh, uh, LPG and the, uh, the Ujjwala Jyojana in this regard is well known and one can uh, one can take pride in that, that about 93 million connections have been released in this till about June 2020. In the agricultural sector, uh, there is a scheme for solarization of the uh, solarization of standalone agriculture pumps. Uh, the target is to solarize about 1.75 million pumps. And also there is a solarization of grid connected individual pump capacity up to 7.5 HP is also there. So I think installation and the solarization of grid connected pumps, both the components are there which will help intensely to move away from the sort of a non-clean sources to the cleaner sources of energy and reduce the air pollution. So the opportunities exist in all the areas, in the power sector, in the transport sector, in the, uh, in the industrial sector to move forward. The new technologies, the cost reductions particularly are important for the developing countries like India. With this, I would like to rest my initial impressions and would be happy to take on the questions. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Saxena. That was uh, a great uh, you know, presentation on the scenario, on the national scenario in India, both on what the NDCs are and how we are on track, as well as you know, highlighting some of the opportunities in across the sectors uh, that uh, you know are uh, in the process. Of so as we're running short on time, I think we'll uh, take very few questions and I would request our panelists to be uh, very brief, um, you know, in, in their responses. Uh, the first question is to Professor Pooji as to what extent this technology remote sensing has been used to apply uh, polluter payer regulation on the road and what kind of policies that have been produced which utilize the data from remote sensing. Thank you for the uh, question. Well, I just will explain short from this uh, question. Basically, that the remote sensing uh, being used for this vehicle is still very new, maybe the last 
four or five years back. But then also again in Indonesia, for example, in Indonesia, it's still very new because we our our work was just last year. But in London, actually, they have uh, they have used this remote sensing data result that was conducted in 2018 in London, and also have uh, they they uh, have the restricted they they developing the ultra low emission zone. So they restricted the diesel vehicle to pass this route because of they identifying from the remote sensing that the diesel has emitted more or higher emission compared to uh, other, other fuels. So that's why they, they make the ultra low uh, emission zone 2019. So I think that's one, one of the come out from the remote sensing uh, technology or remote sensing data to address the issue of the air pollution in the city. But then also in London itself, they also find find out that that a taxi, one of the black cab of taxi, has very high emission there. So then also they have uh, now regulated that the new license, new license taxi has to have lower uh, emission in the car for the future. So that's basically can be applied for individual type of cars or in the emission uh, zone that they've been applied in London. So we can also develop this type of uh, uh, um, policy. It's depend on the, the country itself, how we apply and how regulation and what uh, the priority in, 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 uh, in reducing the emission from transport sector. So that's basically that I can uh, answer. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. Um, quickly, Professor Hukibin, um, you know, China's incredible success story on the reduction of air pollution. Um, but uh, what are some of the best practices uh, and how the government kind of balances the fast growth uh, industry activities with climate resilience and what strategy and policy China implements and how these can be adopted or implemented uh, in other places such as Indonesia? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wadel. Uh, I think so there, uh, uh, in, in, in simple words, I think we, we can uh, share is uh, when you're trying to formulate the uh, uh, good policy and uh, in, uh, enforcement, so we, uh, from scientific side, we have to do uh, several work. Uh, I think the emission inventory, uh, 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 source apportionment, and the uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the the supervisor were based on the monetary data, so that's a, the most important uh, technology part. So when when we're trying to, uh, I just mentioned in, for the central governments in China, they have to do in the calm but differential uh, uh, policy targets in different region, but you have to show the local governments. It's a very strong uh, scientific data, including the emissions inventory, air quality, and source apportionments. So I think this is system, most difficult part is the inventory part, uh, because they have to uh, have the very close, you know, you, you, the, for the, uh, the source apportionments or air quality, you can do in the independent within the environment sector, but for the, Inventory, you have, you have to work in with all of the industrial transportation uh, sectors. So I think we should do that uh, as early as possible. We have uh, accumulated this platform for more than 20 years, and thought now we can use more and more new uh, technology to supporting us. But the basic system should do that as, as early as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Saxena, a brief question for you and your and I invite your brief comments on that. Is there a program in India to manage transboundary air pollution in Asia? So in your case, the South Asian region. I think the studies are on, the, uh, the work is on, uh, but uh, specifically speaking, I think it's a work in progress and one has to see that uh, uh, how does it roll out? But yes, these studies are being done. But if not on air pollution, but there is a program on cross border energy transaction and which is sort of for the clean energy transition. I think that is what is there. You, all of you might have heard about the initiative which India is sort of partnering with France is the One Sun, One Word, One Grid initiative wherein the 
cross border electricity trade of uh, the clean energy sources is, is being planned and this study is on and uh, i am happy to inform you that we terry as a part of the consortium led by the electricity de france of the paris and the aets and i think the by the end of this year the cross border energy trade in clean energy the vision and roadmap will be clear and then the clean energy will be uh, transacted uh, across various regions not only south asia southeast asia on the southeast asia south africa middle east pan arab etc i think there are plans morely on the electricity and energy sector and on the air side also their studies are Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm sorry we cannot take any more questions. We are running short of time, but do post your questions, and we can request a panelist to respond. Uh, you know, uh, by responding on the Q and A uh, chat. Um, with that, uh, let's give our panelists a virtual round of applause or thumbs up. Thank you so much, everyone, for your comments. Um, we hope that we can all stay for the final session happening shortly. In the meantime, I also request all of you to please uh, respond and answer the short survey about this event. The link is provided in the chat box, and it also be sent after the event along with the links to the event video recording and presentations. Um, thank you for this opportunity. I've thoroughly enjoyed the uh, moderating this session. I now hand over to you, Karma. Uh, you will be introducing our moderator for the final session on public-private partnerships and stakeholder engagement. Thank you.